we're going to go ahead and get started because we want to make sure we have time for Q&A at the end of our presentations. My name is Trina Harding and I am the internship coordinator in the English department and I work also on the English Plus initiative. I want to give a big thank you to the English department staff and administrators and leadership for helping to really get the word out about this event and for all their support, um, putting it together and, and for providing refreshments. You'll want to make sure you grab a cookie on your way out and, as a little treat for coming. So we're going to start with a prayer and Lindsay has offered to give that for us today. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this day and grateful to be here at BYU. We're grateful for the many educational opportunities that we have been able to participate in here at BYU and um, pray that as we continue our education that that will guide us in the paths that we need to take, um, that that will put people in our lives that will help us to um, know what we need to do. We ask these to also help us to know who we can serve and how we can reach out in love to those around us. Um, please bless our speakers today that um, they will be able to deliver what they've prepared um, and that we can learn what we need to and we ask that thy spirit will be with us that we can enjoy one another's company and um, and learn and retain information and we are uh, again grateful for this opportunity to be here we're grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ and ask thee to help us to remember him always and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ Amen, Amen. Um, how many of you have been able to attend one of our alumni panel events before or in the past? Oh good, we've got a few. Welcome back. I'm glad you're here for another one. We started doing these a couple of years ago and this whole project grew out of some research that we did with English department graduates from BYU who graduated between 2009 and 2019 and we were looking at the outcomes that they had um, transitioning from their school experience here at BYU to uh, the workforce. And overall, the news was, was pretty good, that, and it was really exciting to see where our alumni landed professionally. But one of the things that that research showed is that overwhelmingly, um, our graduates say they wished they had seen examples of how people were using their English degree. And so this is one of our efforts to help give that information to you at a time when it is going to be valuable for the decisions that you're making about the classes you're taking, how to think about the classes you're taking, what additional experiences you want to try and get while you're here at BYU, all that kind of stuff. In addition to these panels, we've also created this English at Work page. It's on the English Department website. And on this page, you will be able to see recordings of these alumni panels. Um, this one will be up once it's all nicely edited. Um, but you can see past panels as well. But we've also created this English Alumni Stories database. And this is a, it, we're still growing it, but this is a page where alumni have generously shared their stories about what they're doing and how they got there. And many of them have also generously shared their contact information. So students, you, so you're welcome to reach out to them if you find somebody doing something that you think, oh, that looks like what I might want to do. So I encourage you to check out uh, these resources that we're providing for you. So without, you don't want to take too much more time, um, but be thinking while our presenters are talking about what questions you have and we will have some time at the end for Q&A. We're going to go in the order on the previous slide, so Christina Jorgensen is going to lead us out here. Okay, my name is Christina Jorgensen, as you can see. Um, I have kind of like a weird situation. I am a consultant at Bain & Company, which is a management consulting firm, but I'm currently on externship at Podium, which is essentially like a six-month break away from consulting to work somewhere else before you can go back to Bain. So I'm gonna mostly talk about Bain because that's where I've spent the last couple years, but I am using Podium branded slides. So you kind of get a little bit of both there. So just a quick about me, I'm from Southern California. Obviously I majored in English with a minor in communications after a failed attempt to get into the advertising program. Um, while I was at BYU, I worked at the library, the HBLL, worked at BYU Radio, did an internship at the Wordsworth Trust, and then a quick stint at a little Provo tech startup just to get some business on my resume. I love reading, weightlifting, hiking, paddle boarding. Um, I moved to Austin, Texas for my job and there are a lot of one-way streets there. And so my most embarrassing moment is turning down a one-way street, going the wrong way. Um, from college, I loved embracing cheap long-term travel. I did a lot of teaching English while I was here so I could, I could travel for a few months at a time. Um, as well as some internships and study abroads. 
And the biggest regret from college, honestly, just not being more thoughtful about the major and internships that I chose. Um, however, I'll kind of contradict myself a little bit later on that, because um, it all kind of worked out in the end. Okay, just a quick timeline. So I started at BYU in 2013, obviously in English. I was hoping to become a professor one day, so I was kind of going down that path. Not on here, but I went on a mission in 2016 after a few years at college. Um, and when I got back, I was lucky enough to land a spot at the Wordsworth Trust, and so I did an internship there in the fall of 2018 after I, I got home from my mission. Um, that actually, I feel like, sort of changed the trajectory of a lot of things for me because um, not only did I think it looked great on my resume for an English major, but it also pushed my graduation back a semester, which is key for consulting because they're very strict about when they do their um, recruiting. So because of that, Fall 2019, which was my last semester at college, I learned that any major could apply to a major consulting firm. Uh, and so I started prepping in August of 2019, which was probably the most stressful month of my life as I was trying to learn what profit meant, <laughs> what like, revenue and cost meant. Um, and then I interviewed in September, October of 2019 and was lucky enough to land a full-time position at Bain. These consulting firms recruit typically a year in advance, which is why I did not start working until the following year in 2020. I spent my whole first year remote because of the pandemic. Um, and then I did move to Austin, Texas after a year, which is where my office was based out of. I spent most of my time doing private equity work, which essentially is when a private equity firm wants to make an investment, they will hire a company like Bain and Company to do a little bit of additional diligence. So we'll look at the market see how it's growing, see how it's contracting, what factors might be affecting it. We'll also do a bit of customer uh, research. So what do customers think about this particular company or product and how does it stack up to competitors? And I'm now an externship. So I've been at Podium for the last several months. Um, and once that's done, I will go back to Bain, except this time I'm moving to San Francisco, which I'm really excited about. Okay, so lots of words <laughs> on this slide. You might be wondering, what does a consultant actually do? It's a bit of a loaded question. I'll give you a bit of a background on what consulting firms are and kind of what that looks like. So the big three firms, similar to like a big four accounting firm, would be McKinsey, BCG, and Bain. Essentially what you do is you're assigned to a case and a team for three to six months at a time. It could be in any industry for any company, obviously that hires one of these firms. Um, it could be working on a variety of different problems. And once you're done with that case, is what we call them, um, you will get set on a totally different team for a totally different company doing a totally different problem. So it's a really awesome way to actually learn a ton about different industries. Actually, people say you should go into consulting if you don't know what you want to do with your life because it kind of like extends that time where you can figure things out. Some really awesome pros about consulting. It draws the best of the best people. I love the teams I've worked on. Incredibly smart people, incredibly passionate people, super interesting to talk to, and it makes the long nights, as you can see on the right side of the page, totally worth it. I've never had so much fun as I have working on a model at 10 p.m. Um, in Dallas, Texas. Obviously an incredible learning experience, great salary. You'll never get as much salary, salary transparency as you will at Bain. There is no negotiating. They just give you what they give you but it is, it is um, a, very, a very generous salary. And then one of the coolest things, you have lots of perks. So you can travel for work. Um, they give you opportunities to do office exchanges. So you could go work in like the Amsterdam office for six months if you wanted to. Um, they'll pay for grad school. You can obviously have opportunities like an externship like I'm doing. So lots of really amazing opportunities to kind of expand your learning while kind of it's still in this safety net at Bain or one of the other firms. Cons of consulting, it is pretty high stress. Consulting is an up or out industry, meaning that if you don't make the promotion, you're asked to leave, and you can't just kind of sit where you are. You, ha you have to promote every year usually, or every two years. Pretty long work hours, although I will say not as long as you might think, or maybe I'm just some kind of brainwash. I'd say like this schedule is probably what I'm expecting to do like Monday through Wednesday, unless it's a crazy, crazy thing, crazy like, uh, like last minute project. Maybe Thursday I'll be off by seven or eight, and Friday I'm off by five. So I don't know, I've actually found it like quite sustainable, um, but maybe the salary helps. And then you might, you might work in a boring industry, I don't know, especially like in Texas, there's a lot of oil and gas work that you might do, which I personally don't find very interesting. I was lucky to snag a healthcare team, which I did find very, very interesting, but that's kind of a potential con. I won't go over the day in the life, you can kind of just see, there are long days, lots of work to do. What I really did want to touch on is how I've used my English degree. Um, I would say like in my day-to-day -day life, obviously like there's not 
uh, you know, English major didn't teach me how to use Excel, or like, didn't teach me what profit meant, which I did have to learn, which is embarrassing. Um, but it did actually help me in a couple of really key, like more macro ways that I think have helped me, one, be successful in the interview, and two, be successful at my job. First of all, in consulting, it's extremely important that your thinking is structured and organized. And so when I was learning how to do cases, which is what you have to do for the interview process, um, it actually reminded me a lot of how I would structure a research paper. I needed to like basically have a thesis, sort of what I thought, to give you an example of a case, they'll say like, okay, your client has $3,000 that they want to invest in land in Jamaica, should they do it? And you have to basically structure something that walks through in a very organized way, what you would consider in order to help them make that decision or not. You just have a thesis, you break it down into kind of like your three different areas you want to explore, and then systematically you go through that. And it's the same thing in your job. Like my whole job is just creating PowerPoint slide decks and it's, you have to tell a story. You have to tell a story to the client to get them on board with what you're trying to recommend. Because part of, I mean, part of the job is figuring out what you should recommend. The other part, arguably harder part, is trying to get your clients to accept that and then put that into action. So structured and organized thinking has helped me a ton and then communicating that thinking. So it's one thing obviously to think it, it's another thing to be able to present it um, in a cohesive and clear way. So I really feel like my time as an English major really, really helped me there, which are these kind of like softer skills that I think are harder to teach if you're like a finance major or something. Okay, and then just some quick words of advice. General advice, if I could go back, I would have 100% minored in something a bit more technical. That doesn't mean computer science. It could be computer science, that'd be awesome. But like even business, or like if you wanna do something more in like graphic design, like something that's gonna give you just some more technical skills, it would have made me feel a lot more secure, I think, applying to jobs and just being in the job market in general. I guess unless you want to like just straight do something that's just writing, I would really recommend the technical aspect because you just never know where you're going to land. I would say again, internships matter more than what you study, obviously unless you want to be a nurse or, or something like more specific. And so really think about the internships that you're doing and try to tailor those internships to what you want to do later on in life. And then, but at the same time, pursue opportunities that you are genuinely interested in. I really, really believe that one of my favorite things about college was the fact that I got to have so much fun and I feel like I really became a better person at college versus just trying to land a job. I mean, that's a little bit idealistic of me, but if you can kind of get some overlap between an opportunity that you're really interested in and something that would actually get you a good job, that's a sweet spot. But when you're interviewing, they wanna know about you and what makes you interesting and what makes you passionate and so that's why I think it's really important to do that, those things that you actually do care about. If you are really, if you're interested in consulting in specific, um, which I don't know if anyone here is, but I would recommend joining BYU's Management Consulting Association. They're probably the only reason I was able to actually get a job, learn how to network. Actually, this could belong in the general advice column. This is something I feel like was really scary to me coming out of an English major, but is, it is essential in getting jobs. So really learn how to network. If you don't know how to network, join the MCA anyway, even if you don't want to do consulting, and they can kind of help you figure that out. And then, of course, keep your grades high, retake standardized tests if needed, and get some interesting experiences on your resume. So that's all from me. Let me know if you are interested in consulting or anything else. Feel free to reach out to me at christina.jorgensen at podium.com or abate.com, depending on when you email me. <laughs>
a Desert Book producer and editor. I work on the Sunday on Monday podcast, um, and basically it's their Come Follow Me podcast. Um, if you haven't heard of it before, it's probably because your parents are listening to it. But if you um, <laughs> if you have any interest in being better at Come Follow Me, please, um, by all means, listen to it. It's on the Bookshelf Plus app. Um, so my job as a producer, I organize all of the Zoom meetings where we record our podcast. Um, I find, I help find the um, our guests and then I help the host reach out to all those guests. Um, so I sit in on all of our meetings, um, sorry, I sit in on all of our recording sessions and basically tell people like, oh, that sounded a little bit awkward, let's try that again. Or that's actually not in line with LDS living standards, let's try that again. Um, <laughs> which happens more than you think. Um, and then a big job of mine is to edit the podcast. <coughs> surprise, surprise. I, we usually have like two hours of raw and then um, pare that down into like an hour. So it's a lot of editing there. And then finally, storytelling, which is obviously the most important part of a podcast. Um, all right, so this is kind of hard to see, but maybe you can tell by the, uh, the font that this is Instagram screenshots. So on the top, we have Sunday and Monday, lots of followers. Um, so it, it's a really well-loved podcast. Um, this is The Gospel and All In are both podcasts that... Um, I really love and are part of the Desert Book family. Um, so this is just a shameless plug for all of those if you are lacking time and want a diversion in all of your classes. Um, so major to work, that's the big question, right? So I was actually an English teaching major at BYU. Um, and <laughs> let's see, I would highly recommend, I feel like education courses here are amazing. They were some of my favorite courses. And bonus of being an English teaching major, you not only have the English degree, but you also have a teaching certificate. So that you can kind of, when applying for jobs that are English, you can just say that you're an English major with a teaching certificate on top of it. Um, because, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's the same. <laughs> um, so let's see, I, I will be honest, I graduated by the skin of my teeth. It was really rough. Um, so I got engaged at BYU my, about a year before my husband was going to graduate. And I still had a lot of school left. And so my final summer term, I took 11 credits. That's not a semester, that's a term, 11 credits. And then the following semester, I took 23 credits. And then the following semester, I took 24 credits. And then I did my student teaching. I would not recommend that path. <laughs> I would not recommend. <laughs> um, but I had to follow my husband to medical school. So the way I did that was, was through some online courses. And I'm sure your professors would not recommend. So please don't do that. Um, but I just would really like to emphasize the importance of getting an education, no matter the cost. Um, so English as a second language master's degree, I got that when I was pregnant. I ended up doing it in three and a half months. Um, I just did it like full, full time, and I actually finished the day before I gave birth to my daughter. Um, so that was fun. You're kind of getting a sense of my personality. <laughs> Um, and then after that, I was an online English tutor. I served my mission in Japan, and so I taught Japanese people English, um, and that was really fun. So obviously my path is very, you know, not what you would think for a podcast editor and producer. Um, so I really got into podcasts postpartum. Believe it or not, newborns don't do a whole lot. And so on our walks every day, I would listen to a ton of podcasts. And, and audiobooks, of course, but mostly podcasts. Um, and, oh, I should go back to that and explain. So I ended up hearing 
um, listening to, this is the gospel podcast that I mentioned earlier, I heard one of my friends' names, Erica Free, and um, we were in the English program together, and I just reached out to her and I said, I love the work that you're doing, it's so beautiful, and I would reach out to her several times whenever I heard a podcast that I really loved, and she messaged me um, a while after and just said, hey, there's a position opening up, you would be a really good fit for this, why don't you apply? And, um, and I did. And it was a really good fit for our stage of life. Um, full disclosure, I have actually quit. Um, so I'm no longer working with Deseret Book, but it was about a two year long stint that I did. So, thank you. Um, okay, so major skills and work. My biggest job as a podcast editor and producer was to become the audience's ears. That was my job description. Um, which is all I ever did in English teaching. Writing lesson plans, I was always thinking, okay, how are eighth graders going to respond to this? How are you know, seniors going to respond to this? So um, that was a super helpful skill uh, that really translated over well to podcast editing. Um, reading, reading, more reading, so much reading, especially in that semester of 24 credits where I was taking all literature courses. Um, and that helps me just know what made a good story. And then finally, editing. I, my host, the host really loved the whole podcast. And so I, my job was really to kill our darlings, which of course we do in English. Um, so my advice is you really don't know what you want until you see it. So um, Trina here, I loved that, um, that list of English, opportunities that she showed at the beginning. So I would really encourage you to go through that list if you're kind of wondering what you should be doing. Um, because I don't think I ever would have pinpointed this as something I wanted to do um, until I saw it, until I was presented with the opportunity. Um, and second, reach out, make connections. Obviously, that's really important. Um, and it's okay if your path looks different. I think I was kind of down on myself at BYU sometimes that um, I don't know, I wasn't doing as well as I wanted to, and I wasn't, um, yeah, it was just, it was different from other people's paths, and, and that's totally okay, and it's totally okay to have part-time work. Um, you don't have to be a full-time employee. You don't have to, yeah, you just, just do what works for you and for your family, um, and that's totally valid. And um, lastly, Heavenly Father will lead you. All of these opportunities were really answers to prayer for me, and I just, I testify that he's there and he cares about what we do in our lives. Um, this was a quote, really quickly, I'll end with this, um, by President Irene, this, uh, sister, uh, Dr. Coombs, actually. Um, my first semester in the program, we read this together as a class, and it's always stuck with me. Um, so. Go ahead and read that quickly, you English majors, but I'll just read really quickly my favorite part. Um, our education must never stop. If it ends at the door of the classroom on graduation day, we will fail. And then the last line, insatiable curiosity will be our hallmark. And so that's my invitation to you is just to um, keep going, keep learning, and Heavenly Father will lead you. And there you go, that's me. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Sebesta. I am a product designer. I'll actually tell a little bit more about myself in just a moment, but first just wanted to kind of just describe some of what I have done and what I am doing. Um, I work on, again, my, my title is product or UX design. I work on digital products. I spent five years working for an agency called Rain Agency that was based here in Utah and then actually moved out to New York City. So I got to live three years in Manhattan, which was an absolute blast. And one of the focuses there was actually building out digital interfaces for Amazon Alexa, Google Home, multi-mobile interfaces, and mobile and web apps. So these are some of the products I got to work on. Uh, I, got to, I think some of my favorites were Headspace. Uh, if any of you have used the meditation app, Headspace is a very popular meditation app. I got to help build out the mobile, or parts of the a mobile interface, as well as a conversational interface that you could use using Amazon Alexa. And it was just an absolute blast. Um, to build a lot of these products, 
Uh, well, and actually, let me say one more thing. The top left was probably my, my absolute favorite project, project, which is in healthcare. We worked with the veteran, uh, Veterans Affairs Office building out a prescription management tool for Amazon Alexa. So those are just, again, some of the projects that I've gotten to work on. Um, a day in the life, we spend, uh, every day looks very different depending on what phase of project I'm in. But I love my job because I get to try to understand real people's problems. Uh, my mom and my dad often come to me and say, hey son, I, this website sucks and let me tell you why. And I'm like, great, well, let me hear it. Because that's, that's genuinely what I do. I try to understand real people's concerns with digital experiences. If you've ever been frustrated with a website, ever been frustrated with a digital experience, I'm the person who's supposed to be an advocate for that person and to make that digital experience better. So this is an example of what we call a customer journey map. This is uh, basically walking through a phone tree system and me identifying different pain points that could be improved. We generally do this by interviewing uh, actual people who use products. So this is a picture of me in Richmond, Virginia, interviewing different veterans for that Veterans Affair project, um, where I would walk people through a, a working prototype of what we were working on, and I got to see where, where they got frustrated, where they got hung up, what they really enjoyed, and I got to document all of those things. Um, I've also done online testing, which you can see over there, um, just walking through again prototypes, real experiences, and trying to ask people, hey, what do you like about this? What don't you like about this? What's frustrating? What's enjoyable? What's delightful? Would you buy this? Those kind of things. Um, and ultimately, a lot of my work ends up looking like this. I, I like to joke that I draw rectangles for a living because in some of my digital interface tools, I'm literally am drawing rectangles. I do some code, but most of what I do is, is actually drawing using some digital tools. Screens look like this. So my current job is Select Health, more on them in a moment, uh, which is an insurance company. And this, these are some of the screens right now for finding and identifying where, what your current claims are. And so I spend a lot of time in tools like this, drawing out visual interfaces as well as conversational interfaces. So a little bit about me. Um, I graduated in uh, 2017. I ended up interning at an app called Day One, which is a really amazing journaling app for iOS. It was recently bought by Automatic. Then I spent five years working at Rain Agency. Um, so several of those years were spent in Manhattan in New York City, which was, again, just really a really wonderful place. I was laid off in January of this year, which is not a pleasant experience, but it's one that in my industry you, know, you kind of come to expect and prepare for. Um, spent five months searching, working on my portfolio, and then ended up at Select Health, which is a really terrific insurance company based here in Utah. They're a subsidiary of IHC. So again, the opportunities have taken me a lot of places. I've gone from Utah to New York, back to Utah. I've actually just moved this week to Cache Valley. Um, which was a really fun experience, very different than New York City, <laughs> if, you, if you know the area at all. Um, and I got to teach at, uh, teach at UVU, I got to teach conversational UI design there, I got to work part-time at a chocolate shop, if any of you have been to the Taste in Provo, Utah, uh, that was a really, that's a really great place. Um, and I, it, it's a really fun job because it's one of constant learning. So one thing I love about my job is it's a mixture of anthropology, it's a mixture of psychology, it's a mixture of visual design, interface design, of uh, working with real people and understanding what makes them tick. It's all of those things. It's also a very, uh, very much a communication-oriented job. I spend, uh, although a lot of, large part of my job is actually designing artifacts, I spend 75% of my job communicating to people, trying to persuade them. There's ethos, there's logos, there's pathos. I use all of those things. I use what I learned in my rhetoric classes here at BYU all the time to try to convince people, hey, we should go with this design. This is why it's really important to try this for these reasons that go beyond just subjective preference of, oh, I think that blue looks better. And I get to say, well, actually, that doesn't work with the brand or that uh, is a you know, it's a color that psychologically just doesn't encourage trust, or lots of different things. Um, but it's a really fun job and one where we're constantly learning. And I think that's one reason why I love it. If you want a job that's constantly testing you, inviting you to learn new things about color, layout, typography, psychology, interviewing users, communication, storytelling, all of those things, this is a fun, fun job. Um, and it, can, it looks a little different at agency. There's in-house there's in where you can work at an actual product company. 
There's a lot of different kinds of ways you can do UX or product design in different industries you can work on. But it's a, it's, but for what I found, it's great fun. Um, how I use my English major uh, in my work, I will say that web design, this is one of my favorite articles. Web design is 95% typography. Um, most of the web is, is words. And most of what I've done has been words. So obviously there's a lot of visual design, color, layout, typography. Robert Bringhurst wrote a terrific book where he talks about how typography brings words alive in the same way that the composer brings music alive. And it's just really fun. Typography is one of my favorite parts of what I do. Working and figuring out the kerning, the letting, the different kinds of type, and the way that all that contributes to legibility and accessibility. So that's a big deal. Um, I worked on conversational interfaces for a while when Amazon Alexa and Google Home were big. This was pre-chat GPT. I, I ended up leaving kind of this part of my job just before AI blew up March of this year. Um, so it looks a little different now, but it's still, this, has been, this was a great fun. I got to write scripts, test them with real people, and um, bring that to life and, and put that in front of people and work with that. So obviously a ton of communication, a ton of writing, um, working on controlled vocabularies, style and tone, tweaking that based on the, the part of the interface you're in based on the brand, that's huge. Um, I also work a lot with design systems. Design systems are ways that you make, are basically style guides that work for both visual and written word. Um, so visually, are the colors consistent? Are they accessible? Is, is typography consistent across the interface or visual design? Um, that's a big part of it, but also words. So this is an example of a design system, particularly the, the written section with grammar and mechanics. I'm constantly having developers and engineers that I work with ask me, hey, uh, should this be sentence case or capital case? What's the best copy here? What's, uh, what's the best way to get this across? And I have to bring up um, you know, other principles of, of, of grammar, mechanics, psychology, all of that to explain what we should do in these different places. Thank you. Um, and I think just kind of last, it, again, it's a large, large part of my job is communication. So this is an example of a story map. I drew each of those little panels. I'm not, I'm, I'm not an artist, but I doodle and draw all the time for this job just to kind of explain, hey, this is the story of what's going to happen with this product. And it's, again, a huge part of this is just communicating, helping people understand what this is going to look like, what it's going to feel like, what the experience is going to be like. Whenever I do research, I also do reports. I have to figure out how to take snapshots of our research and make it digestible, communicable to uh, a lot of different stakeholders, product managers, engineers, sometimes the CEO, COO, and those kind of people. Making it clear what we learned, what we gained, what, how we're acting on that knowledge. So um, just really quick, I just want to end by saying that um, this is a great job if you just want to constantly be learning, if you have a bit of a generalist mindset. Um, it does require some technical fluency. I came into this industry with a background in some coding before you know, I ever got started. But you know, that's not absolutely required. You can get into this. Uh, I know that I, I was part of the UX design club on here on campus. You can get involved in that if this looks at all appealing. There's tons of UX and product management courses online, and there are lots of different niche tracks. You can do go into the user research if you really like the part where you're putting stuff in front of users. You can go into uh, design systems if you really like the or UX writing, if you really like the writing side. And you can just go into visual interface design if the color and the layout, the topography really brings it to life for you. I'm lucky because I get to do a, a little bit of all of those things, um, and it's a great job. So yeah, that's my story. If you want to learn more about me, here's my email, and that's also my website, BrianSilvesta.com. You can see an example of a portfolio, and you can reach out to me on LinkedIn at that link. Thank you. Hi, my name is Danielle Christensen, and I'm a writer at the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I want to start out by asking, what you think of when you think of a writer. You might first think of J.K. Rowling and her $1 billion net worth, or you might think of somebody who can barely pay rent and is living off of bread and cheese. When I was at BYU, I was afraid that I was going to be the person living off of bread and cheese. <laughs> because what does it look like? Can you really be a writer? Can you do it successfully? And um, I want to 
tell you three things that I think can help you do it if you are interested in being a writer. But first, I want to tell you a story. So um, I got home from a study abroad from Jerusalem and had dinner with my friends one night. We were having falafels in Salt Lake, and I found out that a friend of mine was working uh, for an internship that summer at a website that was very family-oriented, and she was writing articles for it. And I thought, this sounds really fun. This is something I'd actually be interested in. So she pulled a few strings and got me an interview for a potential internship, and I didn't get any kind of job from it. Because when I was talking to the man who I was interviewing with, he said, you really need to show me something that you've published. And so go work for your university newspaper, magazine, or publish something online, do some freelance type work. And I was like, great, I'm gonna go publish something. Not scary at all, not daunting, right? No, it was like, how do you even do that? So at the time, there were some websites in Salt Lake that were accepting some free contributor pieces. And I was like, I'm gonna write for a couple of these this summer. And so I pitched a couple of stories and they happened to get accepted. One of them, the first, one of the first ones was a piece I wrote for Deseret News. It was a movie review of a Sundance movie. And I just thought, why not? Let's write about this, this could be fun. And it worked out. And these two articles that I published this summer, I think really helped me get an internship at BYU Magazine which was actually the only internship I did at BYU, and it was amazing. I loved it. There were fantastic people there. I got to do a lot of fun things. I interviewed people, transcribed those interviews. I researched, got to go to the special collections of the BYU library, which was fun. I'd never been there before. Um, I got to write articles. I proofread the print magazine. I blogged for BYU speeches, and I wrote social media posts. This was one of the stories I really liked. It was about a photographer who took pictures of elderly couples who were leaving the temple. And I found that I loved telling stories that are real and inspiring and informative. And I felt like we need more of those in the world today. That we can't just have news that is, you know, kind of depressing. And I wanted to tell these types of stories. And then I graduated and I had no job, which was great because I went on this road trip for five weeks across the US and it was awesome and I loved every minute of it. And then I got home and I'm like, what do I do with my life now? <laughs> and so I remember lying on my living room rug and staring up at the ceiling and just being like, I have no future. And then my sister was like, why don't you apply to that internship you were looking at for Deseret News? And so I did and I got an internship I didn't pay very much, but it was worth it, at the faith section for Deseret News, which later turned into a temporary position in their arts and entertainment section. Which leads me to my second tip. If you want to be a writer, you have to work harder than anyone else, because it's a hard world to break into. But if you show that you love what you're doing and, you're, and you want to be there, people will notice. When I was at Deseret News, I got to write a lot of really fun stories. I reviewed plays. I reviewed a restaurant, I reviewed a killer's concert, which is my favorite band, so that was fun. I interviewed PGA golfer Tony Finau. I got to see a Nutcracker rehearsal in Salt Lake. I got to interview uh, people about inspiring stories like this little girl who was born without arms and legs. I got to go to a, a photo shoot in person, which was really fun too. While I was there, I wrote more than 164 articles for Deseret News and received approximately 1.7 million page views, which was really exciting for me because um, page views really matter in the news world, and that was up at, up at the top of some of the writers for page views. Um, I also had a story that ended up on the front page while I was just a temporary employee, so that was really exciting. And I live tweeted for General Conference. This job turned into my position at the Church News, and this was a little bit different. I was a web producer for Church News, and I managed their website, I maintained their social media platforms, I helped with brainstorming headlines and doing SEO, and it was a lot more um, analytics based. This was when President Nelson was on his ministry tour too, so I reported on a lot of like church breaking news and stayed up really late sometimes like two in the morning posting some of these stories. Um, all of these experiences really helped me, I think, be versatile. I wasn't just a writer, I had learned how to edit I knew about the website, I knew about social media, and this really helped me in my next position at LDS Living. At LDS Living, I wrote seven cover stories, I edited magazine and website articles, I worked with contributors, I helped write social media posts, 
um, gave feedback on social media, and I um, helped cover General Conference. These are some of the stories that I wrote. Some of you might know Don Bluth. He's the animator behind Anastasia and The Land Before Time. I got to talk to Brandon Sanderson here at BYU. If you guys know Grandpa Beck's games, like cover your assets, I got to interview him. Um, this church artist on the right, Walter Rain, was also a really fun interview. I've talked to the um, directors of the Tabernacle Choir, too, Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy. Um, now at the church, I'm a full-time writer. I'm working on what's called the Gospel Topics, which is now Topics and Questions, Study Guides. So basically all the doctrines that we believe in, not just sensitive issues, some of them are. Um, but I'm working on those study guides. I help general authorities and officers with their writing, editing, and research requests. I'm working on some church magazine articles. I assist with the curriculum and general handbook, if we need any changes to that. And I help for free general conference talks. So once more, if you want to be a writer, I think these three things can really help. If you publish something, if you work harder than anyone else, and if you're as versatile as possible. But if we want to get into some specifics, if you can get an internship at your school or at BYU, great. It doesn't really matter, like, whatever you're most interested in, like, go for the one you want the most. Um, submit your writing to contests at BYU and outside of BYU. This is something you can put on your resume. I had some fiction pieces that I submitted and they did well, and that was something that they were actually really interested in when I was interviewing. Um, you can also work on things on the side that you're passionate about. People want to hear about that when you're interviewing, that you're more dimensional and like look for new experiences that will enrich your writing and make you a more interesting writer. Take classes, both editing and creative writing classes. They use different sides of your brain and they will really come in handy in a lot of different ways. Um, make connections with your peers. If you go remember back to my story, like it just happened from a dinner with a friend. Like, I wasn't really looking for it at the moment, and it just came to me. And take advantage of office hours. I really wish that I had spent more time with my professors. I had some that I was able to develop some relationships with, but I didn't realize just like what a wealth of knowledge that they would be able to help me with. Um, and then look for jobs that are currently out there. If you think you want to be a writer, look for writing jobs and see if this is actually interesting to you. And talk to somebody who's in the field and see if you actually are really up for this type of work. And then um, just enjoy your path. I know that it can be scary when you're like in a broad major and you don't really know what to do next, but it will come. Your career is just one step at a time. And there's this quote that I love from Steve Jobs. He says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backward. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. And I really believe that, and I will add to that trust that God will lead you to the right path. You aren't going to be completely in control of this. He knows where you need to be, and he'll help you get there. Thanks. All right, we just have a few minutes. Um, we need to make sure we're out of here in time for the next class to come in. But we would love to get some of your questions for our panelists. You're welcome to direct it to one specific panelist or generally to the group. So what questions do we have from the audience? Yes, right here. I know that each of you commented or mentioned networking is going to be important. Um, or having these connections to get into your career. What would you suggest in networking college? I know we have lots of resources here, but what would be like kind of your first advice to all of you? Um, how to best network well in this opportunity. Yeah, I would say if you're just barely starting out, if you have a sense of what areas you might be interested in, and if they are outside of like a typical English department, I would actually go to those different schools. And a lot of times they have, like every school will have like career advisory centers, right? And, and then they will probably have connections to alumni. So I kind of start there, start with alumni, and then once you, and then every time you talk with someone, ask them if they have any suggestions for other people you can talk with, kind of expand your circle that way. You can also use LinkedIn. So if there's like a specific company you're interested in, you might type in like that company plus BYU and just see who starts coming up. So alumni are a really big opportunity, I think, and if you're scared of doing just the cold email, rely on career uh, centers within, within different colleges. Anyone else have any 
Yeah, so every single one of my jobs, except for my last one, so I think three of my jobs have come through networking, and as well as some other like part-time gigs, like the chocolate shop, like all those kind of things just came because I was at, a, at an event, and I just struck a conversation up with somebody. And I would say that for me at college, that started it, like, like I knew I wanted to do UX and product design, so I went to the club. I ended up going to the club a lot and became its president, so that, that was kind of fun. But um, I just expose myself to these people. I stay after and talk to them, you know, and just ask them like, how, like, what do you love about what you do? How did you get here? You know, just ask them for their advice. Ask them if there's anything like, that I should do or be doing anyone else I should be talking to. And then I actually found out that the Valley is a terrific uh, professional network. And I just started going to that as a student, volunteering at the conferences that they had for my professional industry outside of college. That's where I really got job opportunities. So I'd say if, you, if there are things outside of BYU that you can go to, if there are professional networks, join them, become a part of them. It starts with like go on LinkedIn, see what, see what's going on there, go on meetup.com. For me, that's where a lot of uh, the events were going on. So. And next question, yes. Yeah, so for all of you, it seems like you have used a lot of like web design and digital literacy type stuff in your work. Did a lot of those skills come just like as you were going through college? Did you take specific classes? Like what would you recommend for somebody who's like not great at stuff like that? Like you know, like web design, that type of stuff, to like gain those skills. Like what would be the best way to do that? I don't know if BYU still offers this, but they did have some classes available, I think, at the library where you could take like InDesign or um, maybe it was like Excel or like other really practical things. If you can take some of that, that can be helpful. I wish that I had done that. Um, <laughs> two things that I really use it, it, right now, um, well, I, we use Adobe all the time to edit. So if you can get like pretty comfortable with Adobe, and I wish that I knew like InDesign or Photoshop, that can be really helpful. So I'd suggest that. The library does offer trainings periodically for those programs. They're free to students. I will say I came into my into, into college having a background in like some coding, so so that helped. But I, I'll also say that I learn um, from the University of like YouTube all the time. Like like there's so much free stuff out there. Just just go on anything, um, and just just do your best to follow along. Do the thing that they're doing in the videos. And there's also great sources like LinkedIn Learning. Um, I, I've subscribed to you for a while, like terrific courses in Adobe um, products and those kind of things. And for me, like um, there's specific courses out there, like in UX design, there's, there's something called Ship Nudge, there's Learn UI Design. There's lots of content creators who sell courses that are really terrific. So if you can't afford to, try some of that. Um, but it's, it's gonna vary based on the industry you're looking at. So like in my industry, I, I didn't need a ton of coding skills, but it helps because I talked to a lot of engineers. But um, I just needed to concentrate on like visual UI design, so that's what I focused on. So just know kind of know what skills your industry is wanting, and just focus in on those. Don't get overwhelmed by like I've got to learn everything else. Just focus on one thing, learn it, pick it up enough to be fluent in it, um, and put something out there that shows that you know you, you learn that thing. It, it, again, in, in my industry, portfolios are, are everything, so you need to show your work, show that you actually know how to do. That. I'm just going to interrupt and ask a final question for maybe a couple of you. How would you say your your English major, your English background, sets you apart in your professional work that you're doing now? Or just... <laughs> yeah, I guess for me, um, in the podcasting world, a lot of people are very technical, right? Um, we were just talking about getting those skills, which I think are really important skills to have on the side. But um, I think I was different because I knew what made a good story, which was ultimately what people came to the podcast for. Um, and they stayed because it was well made, and, but, um, but I think the ability to bring people in and tell a good story is, is invaluable. I mean, I already kind of mentioned this, but, and it, I feel it's a bit cliche, but communication, especially within, if you do want to do anything in business, that's really going to set you apart. Those those soft skills, when you enter something within the business world, you are going to do stuff that's a little bit more technical. So in Excel or in PowerPoint, which can seem kind of daunting, but 
you'd be surprised. There's a lot you can just learn on the job. But as you move up the ranks, what matters a lot more is your ability to communicate with people, to manage a team, to supervise people, and that's where that structured thinking, that's where those soft skills of empathy really will set you apart within that sphere. We, we're out of time. I would love to take more of your questions, but let's give our presenters one more. Uh...